Welcome back to Wellbeing Wednesdays, brought to you by the Tulane University Counseling Center. I am Shauna Foose, a staff therapist at the Counseling Center and one of your hosts for the show. And I am joined by my co-host. Hi, I'm Dr. Janaki Flint. I'm staff psychologist here at the Counseling Center. And we are joined today by Dr. Danny Archie, who is also a staff psychologist here and he is also the sexual and gender diversity advocate for the Counseling Center. So welcome, Danny. We are so pleased to have you back. Yeah, to, uh, get into it. Be back. With us. This is your second time this season. Yeah, I know. Yes. Lucky. We were just saying earlier how we love to have Dr. Archie as our guest. Yeah. Always, always a pleasure. <laughs> always a fun guest. Yeah. Well, thank you. I enjoy being here. So it's a lot of fun. Cool. So we have such a timely topic today. Um, and I'm really excited to hear your thoughts because I think we're all living through this. You've got some, um, some thoughts about how to prevent political burnout mm -hmm. during yeah. this election season. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, as the sexual and gender diversity chair, of course, I kind of tailored this towards the LGBTQ plus community in particular, but this really applies to everyone. And especially I think people um, with marginalized identities and, even more so people who have multiple marginalized identities um, kind of compounds the, the stress here. So um, that's kind of how I've directed it, but I, I think a lot of people can definitely benefit from this. Great. Yeah, ready to get started? Yeah. All right, well, let me share my screen, okay. Um, all right, so to kind of get started, is it working? There we go. Uh, just to kind of talk a little bit about why the election season in particular can be very stressful for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I think it's stressful for everyone because of just the oversaturation of information. So it's just everywhere, everywhere people are talking about it. It's on TV, it's on social media, news stories constantly. And that can just be hard to get a break from. And I think whenever there is things like that, it's just kind of ongoing constantly. It, it really wears us out. Um, there's also a lot of reasonable emotions that come up during this season, right? That there's a lot of fear about what the, the who's going to be elected and how that could affect the, the lives of the LGBTQ community. Um, and there can be sadness over, you know, maybe not who not having um, choices that you feel like really represent your interest and, and maybe even anger over um, how your community is treated um, by in politics. Um, but I think what, what compounds like all of those natural emotional responses is kind of how people react to your emotions. And so there can be a lot of gaslighting and kind of saying that, you know, it's not personal, it's just politics, when politics are personal. And, and, and people kind of say, for example, I, I had someone on uh, my Facebook share something this week that said, I care less about who you vote for and more about how you treat people who vote differently than you. Um, which suggests that you can vote for someone who's going to harm people, but then just be nice to them, and that's fine, right? Um, and, and you can't you can't vote for people who are going to hurt me and then be my friend. It just doesn't work that way, right? Um, but a lot of people will try to act as if you're you're being unreasonable by by being upset by things like that. Um, and so that gaslighting on top of the the natural emotions you're having can be really wearing you down. And then I think that the other layer of that is is really kind of this, this tone policing or respectability politics where, again, you've got this justified anger or sadness, fear, and um, when you express, express these emotions, you're shut down, right? And you're told that you need to be logical and that your emotional responses are not okay. Um, when, how, how are you supposed to not be emotional about things that really affect your everyday life and your safety, your well-being, your health? Um, your family, all of these things. Um, and so all of that, the emotions you experience and the way people react to them really kind of creates this stressful, stressful environment. Um, on top of that, I think there's just this increased visibility of, of hatefulness, right? And I think that just in general, a lot of times people will start to um, express their political views during this season where maybe they haven't done that on a regular basis. Um, and I find that every, every election season, I, I find new people in my life that um, are supportive of people who are, who are out to harm me. And so um, having to 
remove people from my social media who I didn't think believed that way or thought that way. And so that, that kind of disillusionment um, with people around you can be really disheartening. Um, and then I think there's also this pressure when you come from a marginalized community that you need to be active, that you need to be out fighting for you and fighting for your community. Um, and a lot of us are just trying to get by. I mean, you guys are in school, working, all of this, and just trying to live your life. And there, but there can be this pressure to, to really be active as well as to educate others. And so every time you see someone saying something against your community, there's this pressure of, oh, I've, I've got to correct that. I've got to you know, stand up for myself and stand up for my community. And, and that can just be exhausting. And then I think another thing that, that can make it stressful is just not really sure how you can make a difference, right? So not sure how to be active or how to get engaged. And maybe you want to, um, and maybe feeling a little bit helpless um, about the political situation. And I think that what contributes to that helpless as well is, is maybe not seeing any candidates that really represent your interests. And I think, again, for people with multiple marginalized identities, this becomes really, really apparent that maybe there's one person that supports part of their identity, but they don't others. And, and so how do you be politically active when you don't see you know, anything out there that, that supports you? So you guys, guys can see that this is on top of just the regular stress that everyone goes through during this season of just kind of oversaturation, uh, the LGBTQ plus community and other marginalized individuals have all of these extra layers that add to this stress, which just wears you down. So what is, what is burnout? Um, so burnout, we, these are kind of the three components that we talk about with burnout, but I think one interesting way to, to look at burnout is, is kind of from an existential perspective. And this is this idea that we, we all have this need to feel like our, our lives are meaningful. Um, and a lot of times we get meaning in, from work that we do. And, and a lot of times that can be activism and political work and, and being politically active. And so when we run up against finding, feeling as if the work we're doing isn't meaningful, it can create this kind of burnout. And so the, the first kind of part of that is just exhaustion, right? It's just, you feel it in your body, you feel it emotionally, and you're just wore out and tired. Um, the next kind of part is, is just detachment and being really cynical about, about the world, about um, your life, about your future, um, and just kind of because of that cynicism needing to detach. You can't kind of sit with that, um, that helpless feeling, and so you kind of detach from it. Um, and again, feelings of ineffectiveness, that the, the work you're doing or the, the strides you try to make um, aren't effective and feeling like there's, you're not being able to accomplish things. So all of these kind of three factors lead to this kind of just emotional state where you're just really worn down um, and, and aren't able to kind of keep up the same level of activity that you had beforehand. Yeah, I think this is so important to really um, like define burnout and um, I would just add that it really sneaks up on you, right? It's, it's, a, it's a slow process of kind of wearing you down. And one, one thing that'll occur to me when I'm feeling burnout is like, I don't feel like myself, mm -hmm. right? So if, you, if you're finding like, I just don't feel like myself, that check in and see, am I exhausted? Do I feel detached? Have I, you know, do I feel ineffective, right? And then you might be able to, to key in and notice if that's burnout. Yeah. And I think another way that we kind of look at burnout is, is it carries a lot of the same characteristics as depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times it's very specific. So it's specific to, you know, your work or, or again, here we're talking about politics, um, but that can bleed over, right? So it may start really specific and then kind of turn into this global just exhaustion and, um, and you kind of have a lot of symptoms of, mm -hmm. of depression and anxiety. So here are some signs of that, um, that kind of go in with those, those three, three categories that, that lead to, or that define burnout. So this apathy, just, you know, really not caring. And, and again, I think that really speaks to what Shauna said of not being yourself. Again, if you're typically a person that does care and does have this empathy or, um, you know, really is, has this meaning uh, when you're just not caring and it just, nothing seems to matter. That's a real sign of burnout there. Um, Irritability and anger, and, and again, this is, anger is appropriate in, in this season, right? When we are faced with a, a lot of the, the negativity that's out there. 
But I think when we're talking about here, this is irritability or anger that might be misdirected, right? That you're directing it not at the, not at the source, but at the people around you. And you're finding yourself being really kind of on edge and, and uh, maybe treating people the way you don't know, normally want to. Mm -hmm. Worries and anxiety are obvious, obvious there. Um, this loss of purpose, right? It's kind of what I was talking about with it around the meaning there. Feeling hopeless or helpless, which can really be a part of depression, but again, it can be really specific to something um, and then kind of lead to that global. Negative thinking, lack of empathy. Um, so again, just this detachment. Um, again, then you can just really have some symptomatic things. So like physical symptoms, headaches, muscle aches. Um, being tired, uh, difficulty sleeping, not being hungry. Um, and then I think a lot of these, all of this kind of can lead to this detachment and this need to detach. And so a lot of times when we're feeling burnout, we isolate, right? We, we don't have that level of empathy to care for others. And so we just detach, we, we kind of pull back. Uh, but the problem with that is we're then not getting support from others either, right? And, and maybe we need some detachment of, of you know, not giving as much, but we're also not able to get when we isolate. Um, and then that can affect our productivity. Again, if you're feeling so burnt out, it's hard to do the work that you find important and, and keep, keep active. It can be hard to make decisions in that as well. It can, again, that just apathy and um, really just not caring can make it hard to, to think about anything. So these are all kind of some, some signs that, that perhaps you're feeling burnt out. And I, and I think, again, it can, this season is specifically around this politics. And so, um, again, maybe you typically are a very politically aware and politically active person, but you're starting to kind of feel the need to detach from it. And again, that could be some signs of burnout there. So I think the question then is, what do we do? How do we prevent burnout? How do we um, get rid of burnout when, when we get to that place? Um, so I have, you know, some, some definite suggestions. Um, one is, again, because of that oversaturation, is, is really setting limits um, on your, with the, the media that you consume. Um, and that sometimes may be, you know, deleting your social media for a, a little while, staying off of it, um, setting time limits. That, that's what I have to do is I'll kind of, because if not, I'll find myself scrolling and it just becomes overwhelming with thing after thing after thing. And so I'll give myself like 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes at lunch and, and kind of put those time limits on there. Um, and again, being careful about the, the media that you do consume as well and, and notice the things that tend to be triggers for you and, um, and try to kind of avoid some of that and, and realize that reading every single article is not going to help you be better prepared to deal with any of this, right? That there's some level of, you know, over, overwhelming yourself that, do, that doesn't lead to any help. And um, think about making well, friends with the unfollow button. Right? Like if there's something that every time you see it, you feel really triggered by it, it might be time to unfollow or, you know, unfriend or hide or certain mute. posts. Yeah, mute. Yeah. 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 And I think that like Facebook even has like a take a break feature where you can just yeah. like not uh, hide someone permanently, but just for, for this season, you know, and, and maybe that's what you need. It's 30 days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so just like you set boundaries with media, it's important to set boundaries with the people in your life as well. And this can mean a lot of things. This could be setting boundaries with the people who don't um, believe the way you do. And again, whose politics are maybe harmful towards you. And, and maybe there are people that you want to keep in your life or you, you aren't able to get out of your life. Um, but how do you set those boundaries of we're not going to talk about this or you're not going to treat me this way or we're not going to kind of go there. Um, but also I think setting boundaries can mean realizing that you, you may be limited because of just this extra stress in the support you're able to give others. And so really realizing kind of what, when you need to say, okay, I've got to back up and take care of myself right now. Um, I can only give so much support and, and that's okay. That's okay to take that um, and do that for yourself. Um, but the key is, is not to fully detach and isolate like I was mentioning. And so really as you're setting boundaries, you also want to build up your support and and I think as an LGBTQ plus person, it can be really helpful to have a supportive community of other queer and trans people and um, people who know what you're going through. And maybe it's getting, a, getting together and just venting about the, the things that we're seeing in politics right now and, and kind of just getting that frustration out. But it also may be getting together and not talking about it, right? And just having a good time and 
playing some games, sitting around, watching TV, whatever it is you guys do, um, and, and really, but have that kind of support. In, in that. I think it's also important to just make space for these big emotions. So again, like uh, the emotional reactions you're having are understandable and normal reactions to this hostile environment, right? And so it's okay to have those emotions. And, and I think if you don't make space for them, they're going to come out somewhere, right? And this, again, that's where that, that anger about uh, the political environment can turn into that irritability with people around you, right? If you don't make space and time to feel that anger and to kind of have that, that emotion. Um, David, you also speak to, um, in this, um, I think that called up the need for emotional literacy as well, like learning what those emotions are, like when you feel what you feel, being able to name it. Um, you know, when we can't name it, it just breeds frustration, right? But we know something's not right, but we can't really put our finger on it. So learning what you feel uh, is a big part of that. And uh -huh. also being able to uh, sit with it, right? Being able to understand what's underneath it because that anger and that irritability really is just fear, right? Yeah. And it's, it's fear that has not been connected to. So it's coming up as a way to protect you. That anger shows up as like, okay, I'm ready, right. right? So it's a defensive tactic. And that's why it's so important to be able to um, use those real label what you're saying, feeling within that supportive community of yeah. people who can also come through and say, you know, okay, we're going to hold space for that. Yeah, and I think that, that emotional literacy is important, and, and a lot of times we don't have that, and a lot of times people, if you ask what they're feeling, you'll, they'll come up with thoughts, right? And so Yeah, they'll, they will definitely give you a thought. <laughs> one reason, <laughs> one, one kind of clue I help people to, to learn to identify their emotions is you should be able to name it in one word, right? If you can say it in one word, it's an emotion. If you can, if it takes a whole lot of words, it's probably a thought, and it may be related to that emotion and tied to that emotion. But it helps to be able to have that one word of, yeah, anger, resentment, mm -hmm. sadness, fear, terror, right. you know, whatever those, those emotions are. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay to, to have a lot of words if you need to process it to get to it. Because yeah. I know that sometimes those thoughts are like, how do I feel? I don't know. Let me, let me, pro let me think about it, you right. know. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's all okay. But that's and a I good was, point. I was just thinking about like it does sometimes take processing like saying some mm -hmm. things out loud to get right. to the emotional part and thinking about it neurologically like the emotional part of the brain doesn't have language so you have to kind of use other parts of your brain to help articulate what you're feeling it takes you have to kind of work that out and say it out loud so you need these supportive communities or some more supportive resources like therapists to help you do that talking it out part. Mm -hmm. yeah. And speaking of that neurological part, there's also sensory literacy, yeah. right? Knowing how you actually carry, what are you carrying in your body and where are you carrying it and how are you carrying it? Yeah. You know, because you do have an emotional brain, but you also have that primitive brain that's right. kind of blocking out things. And so it's important to, to gain that. And you can learn that through many sources. That's why it's important to, if you feel like you're overwhelmed by it in every day, is it impacting your functioning? Then you know you might want to see somebody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that just how you're speaking, I was going to kind of say something about, yeah, one, one way to kind of get to that emotion when you're having trouble kind of figuring out what it is, is, is think about what's happening in your body because we carry emotions in our body and, and sometimes we tend to carry certain emotions in certain places. And so fear for me, for example, is in my gut, right? And that's where I feel that fear. And, but where anger, I'm going to feel like in my arms and in my chest, you know? And so it's going to be this tightness feeling where it's going to be kind of this uneasy feeling in my stomach. And so learning how your body is affected by your emotions, then you can start to say, oh, that's what that is, right? You notice what's happening in your body, then you can kind of say, okay, that's that emotion. Um, I think another helpful thing, is, it, which is, I think, really important is, is when you're having an emotion, it's hard to identify, maybe thinking about, is there been other times I felt the same way, right? When have I felt this before? And what was going on then? And I think especially, again, for people from marginalized communities, there's a trauma that we carry of just going through the world that, that is hostile towards us. And really kind of recognizing that what's happening in, in politics can trigger that, those trauma responses. And so 
it may not seem really relevant to some other traumatic things you've been through, but a lot of times it really can be. And so kind of recognizing those connections um, and, of like, okay, I'm partly responding to what's going on, but also partly I'm responding to these things I've been through in the past can be really a helpful thing. And again, that's where a therapist can really help you with making those connections, but also kind of healing from those past things so that they don't continue to kind of cause the problems in the present. Excellent yeah. point. Yeah, the, it's really important to, to be able to, to make space for these emotions. And I, I think it's hard a lot of times for people because emotions can be scary, you know, and when you're already afraid to let yourself feel that fear can be even, even scarier. And so, um, again, having a place that, that is supportive to do that with people who, who understand you and care for you, um, or again, in, in a therapist office where that's, that's what we do. We're here to kind of create that space for you to, to experience that. So another important thing is, is, again, taking care of your emotions, but taking care of your body, right? You have to physically take care of yourself. And so you need to be sleeping, eating, exercising. And I think a lot of that can really contribute when you're not doing those things, contribute to burnout. Um, and sometimes, it, especially when it is a season like this, there can almost be this sense of urgency, right? That I have to do all these things. There's all these things that need to be taken care of, uh, again, on top of just our everyday lives that it can feel really easy to just let, let sleep go a little bit, or I can skip this meal. Um, you know, I'm going to not do my regular walk today. And, and as soon as we start kind of letting those, those things that we do to take care of ourselves slip, we're, we're then letting our emotions slip and just kind of all, on a downward slope altogether. So really kind of taking care of ourselves physically is, is a big part of this as well. Keep your foundation solid. Yes, yes. You can't, you can't do anything if you're not physically in a, in a healthy place. And again, I think especially <laughs> out of the pandemic, it's even more important to be physically taking care of ourselves, right? Our mm -hmm. immune system needs to be able to respond. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we're not, you know, taking care of ourselves physically, it, it's not going to be up to the task. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also meaning go to the doctor. Yeah. Go get your checkup now, <laughs> you know, um, get your go to the shot. dentist, yeah. right? Yeah. Go to the dentist, you know, see your therapist, you know, all of those things are also important self-care, right? Um, another thing that's really been shown to help both with like depressed moods and also burnout is gratitude. And so again, when you're having trouble connecting to, you know, you've lost that sense of empathy, you've lost that sense of caring, and you're just really apathetic, um, feeling hopeless and helpless, um, being able to identify things to be grateful for. Um, and again, it can be hard when it seems like everything's against you and the world's against you, um, but identifying the people that are there for you and, and the, the things in your life that, that bring you joy and happiness. And this can just be a small thing, you know, of, of waking up every day and thinking of one thing that you're grateful for, um, whether it's, you know, a hot shower that you're going to go get in, you know, even though just a small thing. Um, and I think gratitude is, is something that you, it's a skill. It's a skill you learn to practice. And by practicing it, um, it really has shown to make um, a big effect on our mood. And, and you can do that in a lot of ways. You can express it to others, right? So reaching out to people in your life. And again, maybe there's others who are also feeling burnt out and being able to express that gratitude um, is a way to kind of give to others, which can then give back to yourself in some way. Um, keeping a journal where you just add things as you think of them, you know, and just keeping a running list. And when you're in that place of like, nothing is good, you can go and look at that list and here's all the good things in my life. You know, here's all the good things in the world, right? Because sometimes the world can just seem a dark place. Um, and for me, it's just remembering just the beauty, um, you know, remembering, for example, this weekend I was uh, outside and like saw a bunch of butterflies I freaking love butterflies. They're so magical, yeah. you know? And so just like those, those little small things of like, there is beauty and good in this world and, and being grateful for that um, in the midst of, of what can seem a dark place can, can really be helpful. Yeah. I find gratitude practice really helpful for sleep. Yeah. Right before sleep, you know, think of three things to be grateful for. Um, it's a way I think to kind of help quiet the mind and, how to put yourself in a good space for sleep. Yeah. Yeah. And really almost good. just kind of like sum up your day, even. Yeah. Like there's three things that I experienced today that, that I can be grateful for and just kind of put a bookend and, and it gives you this perspective that good things happen. 
Mm -hmm. right? Even in the midst of a bad day, here's good right. things that happened today. Mm -hmm. um, and you can pair that with the things that make you fearful, right? You can, you can always pair that because two things can be true. Oftentimes we live in this world of dichotomy where it's an either or situation. You're either this or you're that, right? And so it helps you to understand that you can still be grateful no matter what's happening, right? There are things that are around you that are also a part of your mental inventory. You know, it's all right along in there. Yeah, yeah cause I think a lot of times people think gratitude is just like putting a shiny uh, polish on mm -hmm. something bad, right? And that you're just right. pretending, pretending everything is good and just kind of this toxic right. positivity. And, and that's mm -hmm. not what it's about at all. It's again, being grateful for right. the positive things in the midst of what may not all be positive, right? Exactly. And again, so yeah. we don't want to push down those big negative emotions. We want to have space for them, mm -hmm. but we also want to remember that they don't overwhelm everything. Mm -hmm. Just because yes. they're there exist doesn't mean they wash out the good. That, mm -hmm. that both exist. Mm -hmm. They both do exist. Mm -hmm. right. And we yeah. are wired for the negative, right? Our survival instincts are wire us to notice the, the scary and the negative more than the positive. So it does take practice to hold those in balance. Yeah, that's because it's not getting through to this, the frontal part of your brain, that primitive brain at the back, the very back, is shutting all that sensory information out. So you don't get a chance to really process that piece. So everything is just wah, wah, wah. So that gratitude is really big for helping you to kind of come back to center. Yeah. Yeah. So an, another thing that can be really helpful is, is meditation. And there's, there's lots of meditations out there. There's lots of apps. Um, you know, this article I, I linked here is, uh, is related to the Headspace apps. And, and they um, picked a bunch of their um, meditations on the app that, that relate to kind of the political season. And so just kind of what you're experiencing during this season that might be helpful. So for example, expressing anger, right? And so they, they picked one out that was about anger. There's one that they picked out about panicking when you're feeling a panic, um, being able to have that. And so it's a, it's a nice little uh, article to kind of look at and, and um, link to different um, meditations that can be helpful during this time. That's but awesome. Yeah, I'm going to check that out. Yeah, that is. Yeah. I know. I was <laughs> yeah. like, I got to go check out. I'll bookmark that one. <laughs> right. yeah. um, so what about preventing uh, burnout? I think that I want to talk a little more specifically about just kind of when you're politically active or um, engaging in activism. So again, this is kind of just talking about it. It affects all uh, marginalized individuals during this season, right, during this time. But I think it's even more so for people who spend a lot of time and effort being active um, and politically. And so some, some tips for that is, is one, kind of know, know your role and realize that you can't do everything, that no one person can, can play every role. And think about what, what are your strengths? What are your areas of interest? And how can you um, kind of apply in that, them in that area? Um, so here's, you know, someone kind of came up with some, some different roles that um, are relevant to activism. So helper. So this is someone who uses education, encouragement, um, skill sharing, and is, is trying to empower others, right? And, and is respectful and helping of others. And so that's kind of this helper role. Um, the advocate role is, is someone who really enjoys working with government organizations, you know, and is going to be advocating in for public policy changes and, and really kind of be in that, what those political spaces. An organizer is more someone at that grassroots level, right, and is, is looking to kind of like uh, empower the community and develop leadership within the community um, for, for planning and, and things for the future. And then the rebel is someone who maybe feels comfortable with direct action, such as protest um, and, and kind of uh, standing up directly to institutional injustice and, and holding people accountable. Um, so those are just like a couple roles, a couple ways that different people can be involved in, and kind of thinking about how might you want to be involved and, and what your strengths would help lean towards. I think another important thing is, is be realistic um, and, and have clear goals, right? Again, that, one of the things that can lead to that burnout is, is not knowing what your role is or how to, how to be, how to help. Right. And so set some clear, small goals of like, here's, here's what I can do. Um, here's a way that I want to be active. And, and maybe it's just joining people who are already doing the work, 
right? And maybe you just kind of step in and then, and then you find some, a, a, a hole that needs to be filled, you know, and, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel necessarily. And, and finding that kind of space where people are doing the, doing the work already can be really helpful. Um, celebrate the successes. So no matter how small they seem, that successes, um, when they come, we have, again, that's where that gratitude comes in. We, we need to celebrate, we need to experience those. And sometimes it can be hard when, again, there can just be seen so much, so much out there that needs change that needs to happen. It can be daunting, right? And so you can kind of really discount the progress that's made because you're just looking at all the, the progress that you want to make. And so take that time to celebrate, um, experience that and celebrate it personally, celebrate it in community um, and really kind of have that. Um, recognize all the things that make your life meaningful. Again, I, kind of going back to that existential um, view of burnout is this idea that, it, again, if, if for example, you're, you find a lot of meaning in, in activism and you find that that is a big purpose of your life, when it's starting to, you're starting to kind of experience some burnout around it, it can really kind of feel like nothing is meaningful about your life, right? And that if that's the only source of meaning you're getting, um, when maybe you're running up in some, some barriers or you're having some failures or some difficulties, um, it can really zap you of, of that meaning. And so really remembering that the relationships in your life that bring you meaning, the, the hobbies and interests you have that are meaningful, just kind of re realizing this global view of meaning and purpose that you have. Um, look to those who inspire you. Um, if you don't have them, find them. There's people, there's lots of inspiring people out there, you know, and so look to them and the, the successes that they make and, and celebrate those successes and, and look at how they, how they do it. Um, whether it's people in your life or, you know, famous figures, things like that, like find those people and look to them. And I think that that really helps. And then find a mantra or something to, to say to yourself, something to go over when you, you find yourself in that dark place can be a really helpful tool. Um, so with these last two, I'll, I'll show you guys some things that, that are really inspiring for me. So as far as a person who inspires me um, is Miss Major. Um, so I don't know if you, go, you guys know Miss Major, but she's a, um, a black trans woman who's done so much good work. She's 79 years old and still doing work for black trans women. I mean, she's amazing. I, I had the opportunity to meet her when she moved to Arkansas when I lived there um, and just share some space with her. And she's just an amazing human. And um, she's done so much um, work just from, from a young age and still now. And I think that especially for LGBTQ uh, people, it's important to celebrate our elders because so many of our elders are missing. You know, so many were lost in the AIDS crisis. So many have been lost to violence um, and, and um, hostility. And so just and, and poor health care and all of these factors that we deal with. Um, and so the elders that we do have, I think, are so important and meaningful um, in our, to our community and really being able to celebrate that. Um, so she's one person. And the, the, the movie documentary about her major is, is a really great documentary. If you haven't seen it, just to kind of see some of the work she's done. Um, and she just doesn't take any shit. And I think that's one thing that inspires me about her is she just really stands up and um, speaks her mind. And, and I think that's an amazing thing um, in an activist. And this is a quote um, from the Talmud. And I actually have this posted in my office. Um, and I read this very regularly when I'm having a bad day. I read it multiple times, but I, I usually read it at least every day. So it says, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. So I think this is so important because again, for me, I can, I can find myself overwhelmed by just, again, the negativity and the darkness in the world and um, seeing all the, the hatred and, and things that need to change. Um, and it can just kind of really start to weigh on me. And so really reminding myself that I have a role, I have a part to play. There's, I can do things now in this present um, and not have to necessarily worry about the future and think about you know, the, the big picture. It's, it's really about just doing the good right now um, and realizing that I'm just a piece of it. Um, not everybody, it, it, I'm not all of that is out there, right? And, and even everyone now that exists now isn't everything, right? That this is an ongoing, um, 
process to make progress and make change that will continue um, in the future. And so we're just kind of a piece in the history, you know, and so kind of remembering that that place is something that's really helpful for me. Um, so those are just a few things that kind of I look to to inspire me, but I think that there's lots of things out there that that can be inspiring. And I think finding that and just having that to go to uh, when you're starting to feel kind of burnt out can just be a really helpful thing. Mm -hmm. Mantras are really great to, yeah. it's like a, a real spiritual communication with the body. You know, mm -hmm. we have uh, a saying called uh, the power of the spoken word. And it's the words that you speak, that vibration is critical. So offering some word to yourself is can be so healing sometimes most of the time if you believe it right. <laughs> you know um you know and it could be simple right it could be one word one sentence you know just yeah. something that that resonates with your body um shauna you have a mantra i don't know that i have i mean i do i'm actually looking just past my camera i have like a vision board that i've mm -hmm. added to over the years and um you know, uh, there's a quote up there actually from Freud <laughs> mm -hmm. that says, when inspiration does not come to meet me, I go halfway to meet it. Oh. You know? So if I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with my creativity and feeling inspired and, you know, I only have to go halfway. I don't have to have the whole, mm -hmm. I don't have to solve the world's problems, but I just have to come halfway. Mm -hmm. um, and I also really love um, any loving kindness meditation. Mm -hmm especially when it has the component of turning that loving kindness Meta. inward. Mm -hmm. I find that really um, calming and healing for me when I'm mm -hmm. feeling depleted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Janaki? Yeah, yeah uh, just to piggyback that making an offering to yourself is, is the best way you can heal you in this sacred body. My, one of my favorite mantras that I have used for years is, and here I am. Mm -hmm. It puts me right back in the space. I, it, it is like, it puts me right back center. <laughs> it gets me yeah. together, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, I can be afraid. I can be angry. I can be many things. Mm -hmm. uh, sad. Mm -hmm. And I can just take a breath and say, and here I am. Yeah. Because it reminds me of all the things that I thought I would never get through, that I've gotten through. And, right? And I'm here as a result, like, that's why I was smiling at, um, at, at, at Mama Gray, because yeah. we're still here, <laughs> yeah. you know, we've done yeah. it, we're here, yeah. like, you know, that, that so resonates with me. Uh, yeah, so and as, it made me think of another one I really like, um, we can do hard things, or we have done hard things, or we do hard mm -hmm. things, like, that, that remembering, like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's been hard before, and I've, I've made it through, and I can hold on. Right, and, and not that this isn't um, just as hard, but right. there are times when um, we start to see perm things as permanent, yeah. right? And the only constant is change, right? So what we know today, we won't, we will know more tomorrow if we're steady, we're steady evolving, whether, you know, we're being dragged or we're going willingly, right? Um, and what we knew yesterday, we don't know, we know, we know differently today. And so as things evolve, as we evolve in, in, and become, you know, we're, we're intelligent beings. And, um, and, you know, we are all, always um, in, you know, doing this dance with, with our environment and things that are happening in our environment, you know. But we do push through, you know, most of the time. And so it's helpful to all of these things that, that Danny uh, talked about, Dr. Archie talked about is really just amazing, amazing, amazing. There was no space that was wasted in this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, man, I was healed today. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, but yeah, I mean, every single um, thing that you said, spot on, um, because we have, you know, we have, we're, we're, we're dealing with difficult times. Um, and there are things that we're going to have to, be uh, able to be with, right? And, and, and as they go along, I think these are perfect in terms of giving that heads up, like, okay, here's, here are some real concrete things that you can do to have, create a container for your body, mind, and spirit. 
So thank you, Dr. Archie. Yeah, you're welcome. It's uh, great to be able to kind of talk about this. You know, I think it's it's something that uh, you know is, is important to me and is is things I've experienced and had to kind of find ways to to deal with and manage myself. And so you know, I, th I think it's um, a helpful thing to to take a break and think about right now and, and realize, okay, yeah, the, what, what we're feeling makes sense, you know, and, yeah. um, but we can, there's things we can do to take care of ourselves during this difficult time. Um, and yeah. that we, yes, we can get through this, um, for sure. Yeah, and I think, you know, another thing this does is really show that, you know, you're a psychologist, I'm a counselor and we struggle too. We struggle with burnout. We struggle during times like this. And, and we have to practice what we preach, right? Mm -hmm. We have to go out and find inspiration oh, and we have to practice our gratitude. And, and be right? in community. Yeah. yeah, we have to be in community and connect with each other and support each other. So, you know, when you come see a therapist, it's not like they figured it all out and don't have to work at it. Right. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> the whole We make point. it look easy, but I, yeah. I think, you know, we're all living, living life too and living through these times and experiencing these stressors. Yeah that perfectly yes absolutely um, good point before we wrap up i want to make sure we just share a little bit about the counseling center and let folks know um how to find us and how to come visit with us there we go. just a reminder that um the clinic is now located in the dive complex so you can find um on the uptown campus you can find uh, most of us there on the first floor and um to come and see any of us at the Counseling Center, it is such an easy process. It's a phone call, one phone call, and you get to speak to one of these two lovely ladies, Belinda or Charles Zeta, and they will do their best to set you up to talk with somebody that very same day. We are set up now where we can do that. Um, so you just call our main phone number, 504-314-2277, and uh, they'll work with you to find a time that will work, and then you'll meet with a clinician over Zoom so that um, we're safe, but we can be mask free and see each other's faces and have that connection that's so import important to well being. Um, remember to follow Campus Health on social media. Um, these episodes are posted on Campus Health's YouTube channel, so you can subscribe there. And we're also now posting them on IGTV on Instagram, so you can view it the whole episode through Instagram. Um, so definitely follow so that you'll know when the new episodes come out every Wednesday. Um, and as always, we got to leave everybody. Oh, it didn't show up. <laughs> you know, I try to always have um, something fun at the end. So I went with Baby Yoda for all of you Mandalorian fans out there. Season two, I think, comes out this month. Uh, and baby Yoda and my That's love, a good one. <laughs> my love of coffee. Everybody knows my absolute commitment. Yeah, to I'm committed. You are fully committed. It is my emotional support beverage. No yeah. question. I love this one. <laughs> well, I relate. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So once again, Danny, always such a pleasure yes. to have you with always. us. Always so much good stuff to bring to our community. We're so lucky to have you on our staff. For sure. On our show. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. It's always great to come talk with y'all. Yeah. Well, well, we'll be back here next Wednesday. We'll see everybody then. Don't forget to catch us. All right. Be well. Be well.